Um, for everyone joining this conversation, we've got quite a group right now. Um, Franklin Evans is an incredible artist living in New York City, um, also a teacher and received his Bachelor of Arts from Stanford, which I wanna dive into in just a sec, a Master of Fine Arts from the University of Iowa. And you are known for your abstract paintings and large scale installations of loose, brightly colored geometries. I love saying that. Um, we've talked about your base in New York and you have an upcoming show called Fugitive Misreadings at the Miles um, McHenry Gallery from, it starts June 24th. It goes through July 31st in New York City. Um, that is at 520 West 22nd, just for anybody taking notes right now. You wanna get to there June 24th. Um, and then additionally, a group exhibition of works called You Again that you've put together and have curated that will simultaneously be taking place at the other Miles McHenry Gallery at 511 West 22nd Street. So I just wanted to get all that out there before we get started. Um, go see these amazing ex exhibits. Okay, so Miles, uh, or um, Franklin, welcome. Let's start with when did art become part of your life? Oh, I have an easy answer for that, but I'm just gonna just jump back to slightly. My show is actually on the 21st Street space. He's got three. Did I say? Now, oh, I said so. 22nd, 21st Street. Yeah, that's the. Th I mean, it's they're all they're so adjacent. So I just wanted to <laughs> just throw that. And the other one is on. It is in his third on gallery space on 22nd Street. So it's like, and they do open on that same night, June 24th. So all all, all of that's fine. I mean, perfect. I'm glad you mod, mod, you know, just modest correction. Um, but yes, when did I start art? I didn't. Uh, I grew up in Reno, Nevada. The, I, I don't say this very often, but it was the biggest, it's the, it's a little city, but known as the biggest little city in the world. It has that, you know, famous uh, signposting of that. So I grew up in a place where I didn't um, know art was actually, I'm gonna enhance my lighting there. Um, I didn't know art, <laughs> art was actually, it wasn't part of my life growing up. So I, I uh, sports was culture. I loved playing golf. Um, and I was a re really good student. And I think I sometimes tease the connection between holding a golf club and holding art tools, like to brushes, like, like a, a certain way you hold it. It's like a, like a gentler touch than you would, en you would expect um, if you're foreign to both of those, like golf, holding a golf club or holding a paintbrush. There's, a, there's like a, so I, I draw some weird parallels. Um, Art became my golf once I went to um, college. And it was during <laughs> it was during my halfway like during my junior year that I really started like digging myself into golf or into golf. And so um, I had that fantasy notion of becoming a professional golfer. So I still retain a little bit of that like like slippage there. But I I took um, an art class after I'd um, uh, a studio class actually. I'd taken an art history class. It was during during my junior year that I you know became. Uh, just a, like, I guess I would say obsessed. Like it just took over my space because I loved it so much. Um, I'd spent a, uh, the summer between my junior and our sophomore and junior year, I went to the UK because I did the Stanford at Oxford program in the fall term. Mm -hmm. And so I lived in London that summer and I met all these creatives. And I think the not so out gay boy in me also felt like this is my tribe. Um, there's got to be something else in my world. And um, when I took that uh, studio class and expanded some of the art histori history classes, I just was hooked. I mean, I was so, ex <laughs> so excited to find something that I loved. So. I just have to go back. So we start in Nevada. There's no art in your world, which I have to say for these conversations, it's unusual to hear someone say there was no art in their childhood or in their upbringing. Okay, I may be omitting a little bit. Um, okay. You know, I, I drew like most <laughs> kids did. I was always a very good at copying. And I think I remember uh, drawing some like, you know, jumping antelope from Wildlife Magazine. And I won a, some contest in second or third grade for, for that. But it wasn't what, <laughs> you know, sports, sports, you, like as a kid, you, 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 I don't know, you received rewards for um, what you perceive around you. And I perceive mm -hmm. excelling in 
in um, sports and excelling in um, academics was what I was rewarded for. And it's what, so I became the thing I cared about so much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you were certainly academic yeah. if you wound up at Stanford University. Um, and tell us what, so what were you kind of studying before you took this transformational trip to Oxford? What were you on the path to do at Stanford? Well, I was just pretty like dreaming, you know, like I remember like one, one, I, like during the first meetings with like guidance counselors, I think the letter I'd submitted was, was going to be a Supreme Court justice. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, you know, it's kind of like I'm going to be president, you know. Right. Uh, um, but I was, I was I very much the more quantitative kid. So I, I mm -hmm. um, at Stanford, I started exploring fields that would be in that zone: physics a little bit, math, and then economics was kind of the land early because it has a, a mathematical component and econometrics and. Um, and it also, this is, I think, crucial. It was a, it was a major that had the fewest um, required credits. And so <laughs> with that, I thought, I mean, I mean, I, I think both, oh, that's going to be a little easier, but also it gave me more options for right. taking other classes and being exposed to things that I didn't know. Um, and it really paid off at, at a point when I was mostly done with my econ degree by the end of my sophomore year a little bit into the junior year but i had most of the last two years to dig into art so. you were calculating in an, in a way to figure out how to have more free time to explore your passions yes i think that and i think i retain the econ as a risk averse person like okay how am i going to live in the world so i've got to like you know have some backup plans uh, but i did i didn't even think art was an option even as i started but it was my professors, you know, like Christina Branch, amazing um, um, professor, wonderful painter, and Frank Lobdell, who was like a second generation abstract expressionist out of the Bay Area, studied under Clifford Still. And they just really, they just said, you know, you can make this your life if you want to do it. And I'm like, wow, that's a, that's a possibility. I had, yeah, I just didn't have awareness. I didn't go to an art museum until college like i mean reno had a small art museum at that point it's really expanded they've developed a very fabulous museum at this point where maybe seven years ago i did a big installation as a homecoming um, it's, so, so do you think the impact your teachers had on you is part of why you teach in your own life today um i, I think it's why i uh, not like i don't i think I, a lot of things just happen um and i i've only taught the past four years but i i've gained so much in teaching i teach i teach one class it's on mondays it's painting one at cooper union the kids there are so different from what i remember it's also 30 years difference so <laughs> they're different generation but they they're the art kids are really different than like and more academically uh, minded students um, they're freer, but they're also, they're really committed at a young age and they're really smart kids at Cooper Union. I mean, they're just fantastic. They're, you probably, I suspect you're going to come across, or maybe you've already come across some that you've interviewed who went to Cooper Union, you know, they're just, they're, they're ready to, they're not, you know, they're still young. They've got to figure out, they've got to live a little longer to have the content. But um, yeah, I think I, now that I can draw these parallels, like those professors at undergrad, my fabulous professor, John Dilg at Iowa uh, for graduate school, who has a show coming up at Eva Prince of Newburgh next week. Really amazing artist who is finally getting his moment. So, um, yeah, I connect great, greatly to those people. So let's quickly talk about, and actually just one quick aside that I heard you say, and I want to find out if it's actually true. Did you paint the floor of your college dorm room? I think I, I, I hope that's, <laughs> I, I maybe misstated or maybe it oh. was mis, mis I, but I used the floor. So I uh -oh. was, because I wasn't an art major, I didn't have a studio or even an allotted space, oh. but I, I could only, you know, work there when I was in class and I was, you know, like, strangely not even strangely just wonderfully just like wanting to make stuff all the time so i i needed a space and i used the floor and the walls and i had roommates and they were really kind to like they <laughs> saw how much i cared about it so and i think that working the floor is not totally unusual but it folds into my practice now that's how i start almost everything is things are stapled to the floor they fall i learn i think i'm looking down i'm looking at the walls and up too but I really engage that floor space, like Jackson Pollock, like um, 
I mean, you look at Francis Bacon's floor space. I think my studio looks like a little tidier version of Francis Bacon's, which is a total mess. Uh, surprisingly, <laughs> so. Um, I love it. And I love those types of details. So, and let's talk about math. I mean, people describe your work as very geometric. Um, do you, do you see that sort of your, your propensity towards being mathematical as playing into the art or is that not, not, not so? I think, I think I understand that read, that read. Um, I think it's less so now. Um, I, when I, um, first started beginning to exhibit about 20 years ago in the early 2000s. That first work had uh, followed a period where I worked like five years in finance. You know, it's like trying to figure <laughs> out how to live in New York. I had the econ background and I really got into spreadsheets and um, like random number processes to price derivatives, um, derivative, derivatives instruments. So I used those models in my first videos that were coming out of my drawings to inject an element of randomness. And I think those have never really been shown, um, but I revisited them recently and there, there's something there. I don't know what to do with them. Um, so that early work had it. I see the other thing, the, you know, the geometries, because there's the, the grid or the, and the grid is, um, and, uh, and the grid really comes though out of something else. Like it comes out of me constructing faux Polaroids of trying to inject biography into my environments about 10 years ago. So I printed mm -hmm. like these images in the format of a Polaroid, which was how I saw myself as a child. Those were my childhood photographs were Polaroids, like people of a different mm -hmm. generation. That was it. That was as I was not using Instagram and Instagram was the square format. So it kind of like <laughs> was slightly misread, but it, but it's also now I use it. And so those, like all those accumulated images they just get mapped onto the canvas that I then paint that way. And so I think that's a little bit, I, just one last thing with math though, yeah. I, I did use like um, spiraling sequences of like the golden mean or Fibonacci sequences in a whole cluster of watercolors about 10 years ago. So it folds in, but I think the most present thing in the math is the spreadsheets. Like, you know, I use huh. my spreadsheets endlessly I promise to teach my students every course at the beginning of the semester that, you know, this is a powerful tool. None of, they're always kind of excited and then they run off in their own organizing way. <laughs> so so I, I've used them. I am like weirdly use them. Like, like, like this conversation will go into a spreadsheet notes wow. about it. So then I can retrieve it later. And I've shown some of those spreadsheets in installations and I built a, an installation in Norway in 2015 called spreadsheet space. So it's like a three-dimensional spreadsheet, basically like, a, um, you know, when you bring the planes and what's that, I'm blanking on that name, database, like a database. Well, you sound extraordinarily organized. I can't move on without acknowledging what you're sitting in front of, just as we start to actually talk about your work. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about what you're, what you're sitting in front of? Oh, so like, that's like, that's like, I've been in my studio for 23 years. And so that's an accumulation of studies over time. So like, I think the, I think my, where my finger's pointing, these are <laughs> painted pieces of paper that are going into the Figgy installation. I know that, and it's front and back. And they're like my painted tape screens, but I'm expanding them into, you know, painting um, uh, a more versatile dimensional surface. So it'll hang like 17 feet up and down. You can't quite see it all. And then like, I think on this side, where's my finger there? You know, um, those are like just residue of the painted tape that I developed when I showed it to Scott and Greater New York and lots of installations that I think a lot of people be began to know in yeah. the 2000, late 2000s. Yes. So it's, this studio also has like, like that little thing there is a trace of a study from my drawing center wall drawing in 2005. So my studio is about 20 feet that way, 20 feet that way. I live, and then it's a big live workspace. I live here with my partner. Um, and I think what's so magical about it is it's accumulated this, this, this creative time, you know, so I can only try to match some of that in my environments when I, you know, get a two week install period. Like it's not quite fair. <laughs> I'd love to just transport the room. So. Well, the, it's almost like your version of a working document, your back wall. Um, it's just sort of a living, breathing space. Yeah, like. yeah I mean, I, I, I can share, like, I think it has a strong relationship to um, um, 
Brancusi's studio. So there's a recreation of Brancusi's studio out front of the Pompidou in Paris. And he, you know, he did all this wonderful sculptures that were discrete, beautiful objects. But when he died, he stipulated that he didn't want the work to leave the studio and he wanted to show it in situ, in its environment and never, um, you know, like that was the only way those were the terms. Eventually the studio got knocked down so they rebuilt the version of it out front of the Pompidou. to do. But it's a magical place. It's a, something that we as artists, I mean, especially makers, artists understand. So that's, that's where I feel like I really connect. Let's quickly talk about color palette. Um, obviously we see sort of these just really kind of explosive brights and primaries. Are you, do you have sort of a signature palette? What draws you to bright color? Well, um, I think I, you know, I think about that. I, 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 um, I think I'm drawn, I, I'm, I'm, I'm drawn to like, I use other artists palettes, primarily Matisse mm -hmm. a lot. I mean, this is like, God to me in, in the color zone. <laughs> He's God in a lot of ways for painters. He's just, just um, a lot of painting roads lead back into that zone. Um, so when I get stuck, I pull, pull out my Matisse books and I just kind of like flip through. I'm like, oh, that's really like so clever. Like the orange just weighs down over at the left edge and you've got this like tonal um, like earthiness. And you, it, I don't know, it's just like all of those things that excite me. Um, so that's when I'm stuck. So when I'm, the other way, when I'm not usually that stuck is I think I really rely on the 20 year lived experience in this studio. So all that surrounds me, so like these traces back here, like if they're up, I feel like I'm not actively seeking them out, but I'm subconsciously being directed to use that. And I feel like it's, it's like an organic move over time. And I think this current show at Miles with you know uh, 10 new paintings, they're bright, but there's a lot of, um, I'm, I'm toning down zones because I'm trying to amplify some of the, the brighter areas. You know, I, like there's like, I've got a lot of faces that come out of art history um, and I'm trying to like have some jump forward more, some recede through both color and also a total range, a value range. So, so yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, I listen to other artists who like have, different reasons like moods and whatnot i'm not doing i think the mood that happens with my palette is joy and it really <laughs> it's it is totally it's always that because this this room is joyous i i love yeah, being in here it. so that's so wonderful yeah. to hear yeah, yeah um i was hoping you'd say something like that um so let's talk about this 20, 20 years. I mean, that's a long time to be a working artist. And let's talk about how you see your work when you started and sort of the evolution. What's new today and what, do we, what will we come to find in this exhibit that's coming up? Yeah, well, I mean, 20 years ago, um, even though I was here, I had developed a practice because before I moved here, I had a much smaller space. So my large ambitious oil paintings in graduate school that never totally <laughs> I never totally pulled off I had to reduce I had to work on a table so I, I started working on paper and watercolor I said that 20 years ago my work were these complicated watercolors um, fantastical landscape world spaces that aren't that dissimilar in that feeling of this fantastical space as my new paintings um, but I showed those like at in 2005 at the drawing center and that just kind of set it off you know like that was a really good public launching place um and i think so what's different now is the scale is much vaster um mm -hmm. i am also um in this new work the new paintings um i'm mining image the image world that we live in like you know like i took images but i mostly just went to museums and looked and took notes or went right. to galleries and took notes, but we now we always take pictures of what we see. And mm -hmm. I, I, I amass this archive of stuff. Like, so all those things get printed, they, you know, like down on the floor over there are several things from many artists of shows I've seen in the past year. Those are populating the paintings. And I think the other giant change is that I started seeing about 15 years ago, things around the studio, like these things, that were, mm -hmm. you know, like the wall, were just as interesting as the singular watercolors. I'm like, that is 
powerful in, in telling the story about your paintings and they can be, and that's why I build these environments like the one I'll be doing at the Figgy Museum where I return, it's almost like a 30 year return show and be going there <laughs> like the same, around the same time as the Miles show. Opens. I just wanna pick up on one thing you just said to sort of clarify. When you say these pictures are sort of emerging somehow in the work, these things that you're taking pictures of, how so? Can you describe that a little bit? Well, I think like I have one painting, a few that are called um, um, decentered, once decentered space, space and once fugitive based space. So it's all these faces from art history and contemporary mm. practice. So like Carrie James Marshall's face of an unfinished, um, from his unfinished show at the Met a few years ago, Dana Schatz, um, Matisse, um, so many, Jackie Gendel is in my group show. So like these faces get cut out and then I um, are printed and then I, I paint just that zone, you know, and they just like like this like world of spinning faces in a way, mm -hmm. hopefully with some spatial spatiality, like a, hopefully a circular. And I'm doing, I think the other thing in those paintings that I hope the viewer noticed is I'm constructing different types of spaces. I have one like called Titian a Tilt, where I'm mm -hmm. really tilting the plane, you know, and it's taking Titian's uh, Diana from the Death of Actian at the L a National Gallery in London that I saw several years ago. And it, the painting made such an impression of the layering of Titian. And um, so I painted that figure to scale, but I tilted it on the plane. So it's all this, you know, it's like, it is the brain space of the images. I'm, I feel like I'm like all of us. We all look at so much and our brains are just like saturated with, with you know, image, image, image. And some that we don't think about that long, but we keep thinking about and they become more and more powerful. So. Absolutely. I, well, I can't wait to get to New York to be able to see this exhibit in person because what you're describing, it really feels like being in the space is su such an important part of the process. Yeah, I think, well, I think um, for both the shows in New York, they're like my painting show is paintings and I hope the paintings get closer to that all encompassing aspect that happens in my installations. And the, the group show is, um, it's, it's got such a parallel sensibility. I'm working with nine artists who I, I could have had 40 artists if we had enough space, but artists I admire and I'm and so inspired by that I have folded their work at some point into my own, usually through painting in detail. So it's like, you know, it just feels like we keep giving and giving forward and forward and forward. hopefully it's like a snowball of gift. I mean, it's a little bit too gentle a version of it all, but that's that's kind of how I feel in this, and how we can use this available space of how we collect and see all this stuff. Can you tell us about a few of the artists that are in the curated show and sort of how you did come to pick the nine? Yeah, well, I think that one key part is that they have been in my brain space for more than 10 mm -hmm. years, and I have been working with something from their images. So I think three, like, I think if two of them are expanded field painting, Pedro Barbeto and um, Fabian Marcaccio. That's so close to like this painting, not just on a wall and an object, but just goes out and becomes something beyond just the object. Um, not that, I mean, I don't mean just as a, you know, to diminish that, because the object, some of the other, other ones are object painters. Um, uh, I think of Jackie Gendel and Elliot Green and um, Tom McGrath and um, Tracy Miller's like these kind of flourishes with like material of paint. And there's like so much dazzling skill to construct their work. And I think the last, th I want to mention them all, the last three are Eric <laughs> Wolf. Josephine Halverson and Anne Peibel. What I really, really get into about, and they make such different work is, but they have these specific limits. They use such specific limits in their work that it, it, um, it takes them to a place that, you know, like Josephine has this like, like kind of empathetic touch. And she really frames in such a way that you're led to see, but then to know there's more once you've looked long enough, she slows you down. So there, and then and I think lastly, just I just have to shout out like Deborah Jo Imer book got the book is the inspiration for the show. And this, she's a writer I met at McDowell a few years ago, but her book, You Again, came out last year. And she has a protagonist a character who is an artist in contemporary New York who keeps seeing her young artist self in the 90s, the <laughs> 1990s. So I'm pairing all these artists, their new work with an old work. So they, the old, the past and the present keep looking at each other. That's so, great. Yeah. Love it. I want to go back to you and I want to read a quote that one of our editors from Art in America said about you. Um, and it says, 
So this is about your, in describing your work. Many of them contain more visual information than we can assimilate, more citations than we can trace, more cross-references and juxtapositions than we can keep track of, more stylistic diversity from geometric abstraction to Trump Loy and everything in between. Um, so I just, I love this. And it says, nor does it help that many of the images are positioned upside down or sideways in kaleidoscopic jumbles. So the reason I'm reading this is because for anyone joining this conversation who's not you know, familiar with Franklin Evans, does this adequately express the work I think it expresses some, like a rough, it, it, that's Raphael Rubinstein. And <laughs> yes, he, it's Raphael Rubinstein. He work. knows my practice really well. And I thought it's like I, the essay for the catalog is his. And he, it's just, it's beautiful. Like I read it and I'm like, wow, he gets what I'm doing in so many ways. <laughs> and I think that jumble is like, I, I mean, it's, it, it's in opposition to like a, I'm not trying to be oppositional, but it's the opposite of an artist that slows you down. I, I, you can slow down in the kind of ca complexity, almost chaotic space of my paintings, my, my installations, but I'm giving you really, I think like, I'm kind of fairly transparent as a person. Like I give you what it is. Like, I don't know if we're hearing some of the horns on the street out on Houston street right now, nope, but okay. Not. Well, it's made these, these wonderful <laughs> ear, noise canceling. But I really, I, and so I feel like we live in this world of just, just image saturation and my brain is gone there. And so yeah. I, that's what, I, that's what I make. Um, and I feel like, um, I hope that that's what, and I, I make it out of all these things I love. So I hope it just kind of, you know, somebody takes it and runs with what I've made too. Yeah, I'd love to watch you because it sounds like you're so organized. You have like this system for filing all of these things that we are bombarded with. And then what does it take to actually sort of get started and then well, finish one of these installations? Yeah, well, that takes a lot of, that does take a lot of organization. That is the spreadsheet, you know, like I just, <laughs> I, I just, you know, like that, you know, I, everyone has to-do lists and my, mine is kind of old fashioned in a spreadsheet. I know there's probably much better software for managing one's, um, you know, life and business and studio. Uh, but if you, I hope you can come over to the studio one day, you'll see the I'm chaos right. and you'll be like, <laughs> okay, I see why he needs spreadsheets because like, I don't see how he can work in here. But it's part of that chaos that yields you know, like, like incidents of being really connected. Like it's not just printing a Dana Schutz or an Alex Katz, it's that it gets distressed on my floor and just lives there for a while. And maybe it tears or turns or fades. And it's like something about that is what becomes really interesting. So it's time, time's relationship with as a kind of the great mediator. So. Is there music on when you're putting together work? Only when I'm really tired. Usually there, are, I'm listening to things like this. I'm listening to tons of podcasts, like, like daily. Like, and, and that's kind of the beauty of making paintings. Like, it's like you're working a different part of your brain. So you get to um, also consume a, from another part of your brain. So I start the morning every, oh, I, I do it all day, actually. <laughs> We have a few more minutes and I want to okay. get to a few more questions. I just want to ask you if you, you know, for young artists that are, are listening right now, what advice would, would you impart? Well, wow, there's so much, but um, I say be nice. Really kind of just be, <laughs> like, be a good, be your best person. You know, like if you're not a nice person, that's okay. Just be the best version of what, what you are. Work really, really hard. Um, I think you have to just like, be in your studio as much as you possibly can. I think you need to get out and see a lot of art, you know, and if your work, you know, I, I think some people think they can see it all on their phone. Material work, I think you can't. You've got to go and see what's happening with this thing that looks so flat on a phone. If your work is meant to be seen and um, if the work is meant to be seen on a, on a screen of that dimension, yeah, of course you can, you know, dig into that. Um, and what you know like i i don't know i guess it's like, like i work really hard oh and also open up your cultural you know the cultural box read a lot you know yeah. read artist biographies read um cultural histories read uh and listen to and there's so many great podcasts you know like there's just so much inspiration that one can get just um you know 
24 hour um, podcast feed. Absolutely. So we know that we've talked about the upcoming exhibits that are taking place at Miles McHenry Galleries from both spaces. We've got, got your your nine, is it nine paintings and fugitive mis misreadings? It, uh, 10 new paintings and three new, new water. Paintings. Yeah, three new watercolors. So, and one of, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, they're all talking to all of that. I mean, Matisse pops up in a couple of them. I think there's one that I particularly am excited for the, hopefully the public to see. It's, I think it's sort of daring and that I'm taking on the joy of life. And Matisse is painting at the Barnes and I'm painting it kind of to scale but I'm repeating and adjusting so many parts of it and I'm amplifying the brightness of the yellow and then surrounding it by a framing of a, it's like a dull, well, it's in areas bright purple too, bright and dull purple. I'm composed out of all the figures or many of the figures from that painting. So, and then I have a, a matching watercolor that's all pixel, but two, di two different pixel scales. So you read the piece, if you know the, that Joy of Life painting, you see these strong ties. So it's like building joy 114 years later, again. Joy So squared. fantastic. I mean, the word joy, I think you've said the word joy three times in this conversation. Not that I'm counting, but that's, it's <laughs> so wonderful to hear you, an artist, so positive post this, you know, pandemic and also just so excited about this un upcoming ex exhibit. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the viewers of Art News today? Um, I think, well, I'm really happy we're all coming out of this pandemic. I hope we all come out that we, I think many of us are coming out better people. So I feel it, it's, you know, like it's, it's terrific. Um, I have a show that's opening in Milan. I'd be remiss not mentioning that that's opening, I think right now, or not Milan, in Lugano. But I, I really, what I liked about that is I sent Solowit type instructions for the installation to be executed. <laughs> so, and that Solowit is factoring significantly into my installation at the Figgy, which has got some crossover to one of the paintings in Miles' show. But I'm using Solowit that I'm building his sculpture that's outside and his big wall drawing that looks down on my installation. I'm building them out of my materials and I'm projecting a rapid fire animation onto the Lewitt outside built out of how the, uh, the installation emerged over the basically the time period of the pandemic, January 1st, 2022, its opening date in June. So, That's and, so exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it, 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 you know, life requires a lot of timing, you know, and, and, um, and maybe we also have to frame it in that way that you know, like sometimes it's not good timing, but sometimes it's not even that great timing, but you frame it like, wow, this is great timing. You know, like you find some way to, I think, I think give power to all of your, wherever your position is. So. Um, sometimes there's no such thing as perfect timing. Yeah, I don't even know what that is. We, yeah. we, we admire some people who get totally to the top and you go like, oh, they had they, everything. They're great right. artists, they're great, you know, yeah, so. Um, I'm excited also, I just wanna say like, I had a meeting with Miles last week and there are two ideas curatorially that I think are so interesting that I think, um, I hope will be realized pretty soon. So uh, my work can fold into like so perfectly. So he, it, it, yeah, and so it's just an exciting, I don't know, it's a very exciting time. I'm really happy to have been invited by all of you at Art News and to oh. meet you, you're just fantastic. The series and, oh. and this whole audience who, you know, participates. We're, this is how we keep giving to each other, I think. So. It's so wonderful. Um, first of all, you are delightful. And um, it's been such a great way to connect and have candid, authentic conversations. Um, we've just met such wonderful people. And it's so, it's so inspiring to see how many people are engaged with this type of conversation. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we especially needed it. And I think we're going to continue. It's like, that's part of our world that's changed. Just so I think we'll be able to have this. This is where we can see people. Well, you're in LA, I'm in New York. We can have a conversation like this. And people are watching probably in other places, many other places. So. Absolutely. It's been a great unifier, IGTV, globally. So it's been pretty awesome um, to talk to people around the world and in the country. But thank you, Franklin Evans. Um, loved this conversation. We will follow you. And I'm making a trip to New York to see this exhibit. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll say hi to you. I would look forward to meeting you, IRL. Okay. okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye.